Hey guys, in this video we're going to finish up AP Biology Topics 1.4, 1.5, and 1.6 on the specific topic of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are polymers that store, transmit, and express hereditary or genetic information. This information is encoded in the sequences of monomers that make up nucleic acids. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA, also called deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, or ribonucleic acid. DNA stores and transmits genetic information, though RNA intermediates the information encoded in DNA and is used to specify the amino acid sequence of proteins. Ultimately, nucleic acids and the proteins encoded by them determine the metabolic functions of an organism. Nucleic acids are polymers composed of monomers called nucleotides. A nucleotide consists of three components, a nitrogen containing base, a pentose or five carbon sugar, and one to three phosphate groups. The bases of the nucleic acids take one of two chemical forms a six-membered ring structure called a pyrimidine, or a fused double ring structure called a purine. An easy way to remember which nitrogenous bases are pyrimidines is to take note of the Y in their name. Pyrimidines include cytosine and thymine. RNA and DNA differ in the types of nitrogenous bases that are found in their nucleotides. Four bases are found in DNA, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. RNA also contains adenine, cytosine, and guanine, but the fourth base in RNA is uracil rather than thymine. The type of sugar found in a nucleotide also differs between DNA and RNA. In RNA, the pentose sugar is called ribose, and in DNA, the pentose sugar is deoxyribose. The lack of hydroxyl group at the second prime position of the deoxyribose sugar in DNA makes the DNA structure less flexible than that of RNA. DNA, as we will discuss later, is composed of two polynucleotide strands, whereas RNA is typically single-stranded. However, RNA can fold up into itself, forming a variety of structures that also play a number of different functions within the cell. During the formation of a nucleic acid, new nucleotides are added to an existing chain one at a time. The pentose sugar in the last nucleotide of the existing chain and the phosphate of a new nucleotide undergo a dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction, and the resulting linkage is called a phosphodiester bond. The phosphate on the new nucleotide is attached to the five prime carbon of its sugar, and the bond occurs between it and the three prime carbon on the last sugar of the existing chain. Because each nucleotide is added to the three prime carbon of the last sugar, nucleic acids are said to grow in the five prime to three prime direction. This is an important thing to keep in mind for AP Biology as it comes up numerous times throughout the year. The key to understanding the structure and function of both DNA and RNA is the principle of complementary base pairing. In DNA, Adenine and thymine always pair together, and cytosine and guanine always pair together. In RNA, where thymine is replaced with uracil, adenine and uracil pair together, and we keep the same pair between cytosine and guanine. Base pairs are held together primarily by hydrogen bonds. As you can see, there are polar carbon to oxygen and nitrogen to hydrogen bonds in the nucleotide bases. Hydrogen bonds form between the partial negative charge on an oxygen or nitrogen of one base 
and the partial positive charge on the hydrogen atom of another base. Complementary base pairing occurs because the arrangements of polar bonds in the nucleotide bases favor the pairing of bases as they occur. Cytosine with guanine produces three hydrogen bonds, and adenine with uracil or thymine produces two hydrogen bonds. Individual hydrogen bonds are relatively weak, but there are so many of them in DNA and RNA that collectively they provide a considerable force of attraction. However, this attraction is not as strong as that provided by multiple covalent bonds. This means that base pairs are relatively easy to separate with a modest input of energy. As we'll see when we get into Unit 6, the breaking and making of hydrogen bonds in nucleic acids is vital to their roles in living systems. Next, we'll take a look at a little more detail of the structures of DNA and RNA. Usually, RNA is single-stranded. However, many single-stranded RNA molecules fold up into three-dimensional structures because of the hydrogen bonding between nucleotides and separate portions of the molecules. An RNA strand can also fold back on itself to form a double-stranded helix. This results in a three-dimensional surface for the bonding and recognition of other molecules. It is important to realize that this folding occurs by complementary base pairing and the structure is thus determined by the particular order of bases in the RNA molecule. Usually, DNA is double-stranded. That is, it consists of two separate polynucleotide strands of the same length. The two polynucleotide strands are anti-parallel. That means that they run in opposite directions so that their five prime ends are at the opposite ends of the double-stranded molecule. In contrast to RNA's diversity and three-dimensional structure, RNA is remarkably uniform. The adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine base pairs are about the same size. Each purine is always paired with a pyrimidine. And the two polynucleotide strands form a ladder that twists into a double helix. The sugar phosphate groups form the sides of the ladder and the bases with their hydrogen bonds form the rungs on the inside. The double helix is almost always right-handed. DNA is a purely informational molecule. The information carried for all of your proteins and your phenotypes, your physical characteristics, are encoded in the sequence of bases carried within its strands. Now, DNA I like to think of as a cookbook. It contains all of the recipes that you will need to make a wonderful meal. RNA is used as a short-term copy of a segment of DNA. So think of RNA very much like just a single recipe. It is the recipe for that particular meal, that particular food stuff. And then that recipe can go on to be used to produce your dish. So we go from having all of the information to a specific amount of information to the actual product. Now DNA can be reproduced precisely through a process by DNA replication. To make a replica of something is to make an exact copy. We'll talk more about this in the future when we get into Unit 6. In order to make a small snippet of information, your mRNA molecule, we have to undergo a process called transcription. Whenever you transcribe something in class, that means that you're taking in a piece of information and you're writing it down on your own sheet. It's not the exact information, it's just a small portion of it. So we're transcribing a small portion of information from DNA to RNA. And again, this process is one that we'll talk about more in detail in Unit 6. Now to go from RNA to the final product of a protein, we undergo a process called translation. When we translate something, we're taking it from one language to a new language. 
So you can think of it, we're taking it from the language of nucleotides, that of nucleic acids, and recreating it in the language of proteins, that is our amino acid sequence. The information covered in this video talked about the basic structure of nucleic acids. Later on in AP Biology, we'll focus a lot more on the details of the processes by which we produce those proteins or amino acid sequences in order to give us unique characteristics. If you have any questions concerning nucleic acids, be sure to drop them in the comments below or email me directly. Thanks!